I can hire anybody off the street to manage data, mm-hmm. to manage metrics. Mm-hmm. I have to look for the qualities of a good leader. Mm-hmm. And if you can get a good leader, they can manage a team to success. Mm-hmm. Hey, welcome to another episode of the Coffee Break Podcast, where our mission is to share business ideas, practices, and strategies while we enjoy our cup of coffee. Real quick, before we get started, share this episode on whatever social media platform you're watching this on. If you're watching this on YouTube, hit a share and and post it out on your favorite social media platform. If you're on LinkedIn, you're seeing this, or if you're on Facebook, make sure you share it out and tag somebody that may get value out of this conversation. Today's guest is going to be incredible. Lynn Beaver is our guest today. She's going to be talking about all things leadership and the human side of leadership. That's really the incredible takeaway from this conversation today, the the care and practical nature that she gives to her leadership and the way that she leads other people and coaches them for success. You're going to get a lot of tips out of this today. We invite you, if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe to the podcast. We have over 130 episodes for you to check out on business ideas, practices, and strategies that you will get value out of. So go check that out at lockdoc.net slash podcast, and you can subscribe there on the video and uh, on the audio version as well. You can find your favorite podcast platform, or you can follow us on YouTube and get the brand new episode that we release every Tuesday morning at 9 a.m. But for now, grab a cup of coffee and get ready for this conversation. We got so much to say. We got a podcast to make, we're sipping on lattes, and it's time for a coffee break. It's time for a coffee break. Oh, oh yeah. All right, welcome, Lynn. Thank you very much for being here today. Thank you for having me. I am uh, super excited to have this conversation. So full disclosure, Aaron Beaver is your son who is also the Alec Baldwin of our podcast. He comes on about every other week. Uh, but uh, he said, you've got to get my mom on the podcast because she is m- amazing individual. So uh, pretty excited to have this conversation today. No pressure at Thank all. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, um, before we jump into it, we do have a segment called Rapid Fire, five randomly selected questions just to get under your skin with an unknown point value. Okay. You ready? I'm ready. All right. Number one, what is the weirdest food that you've ever eaten? Um, raw fish. Raw fish. Mm-hmm. Like like in sushi or sushi. just okay. I love sushi. Okay, but there are some of the sushi is like it's <laughs> <laughs> just too much. Okay, number two. What's the most out of character thing that you've ever done? I don't. That's a hard one. Give me another one. <laughs> <laughs> what? Wait. Uh, number three. What is your cell phone wallpaper? Uh, my family. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I figured that would be the case. Uh, all right. Number four. You can have an unlimited supply of one thing for the rest of your life. What is it? Having my family around me. Oh, look at that. You're 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 big with with the family, right? Very You've got big. two. You have a unique family situation. Tell me about it. You have two kids. I have two kids that married brother and sister. So your kids married another brother and sister. Mm-hmm. And now you've got grandkids. How many grandkids do you have? Three grandkids. And you guys are all kind of moving on a big compound together. Right. Right. <laughs> and that was intentionally planned. Yeah. I grew up without uh, active grandparents. And I told my kids when they were growing up that I wanted to be the grandmother that the grandkids wanted to come to my house. I wanted the grandkids to call me and say, my mom and dad are being mean to me. Come get me. And so I've been that type of grandparent that is very active in their lives. Well, that's that's incredible. And I from a distance, I have seen that. So that's you have definitely succeeded in Mm -hmm. that aspect. That's that's very cool. Very cool. All right. uh, Let's see. Number this is going to be number four and a half because I've got to give you a bonus question. Uh, What is the strangest gift that you've ever received? Uh, Probably a strange paperweight. Strange paperweight? Mm Mm-hmm. That people think is is a funny paperweight, but it's just (laughs) odd. (laughs) I'm very predictable. Uh, Versus my son, who is very unpredictable. Well, very predictably unpredictable, right? Right. All right. Uh, And then the last one. Uh, Let's see here. 
would you rather always be cold or always be hot? Cold. Cold. All right. Well, cool. Thank you for uh, for joining us for the rapid fire questions, Thank you. and we'll give you a score of seven hundred and ninety six. So Great. Congratulations. All right. So let's let's jump into the conversation a little bit because we were talking before, and you were mentioning uh, some of your excitement about leadership, and I want to dive into that because that's really going to be kind of the heart of our conversation today: developing leaders, managing uh, other leaders, and trying to get the best out of people. So I want to dive into that, but before we get down to that point, I want to understand a little bit about what drives you as a as a human being so you have been in the nursing is it an industry the nursing Mm -hmm. world for uh for a while what drew you to to that environment i actually actually accidentally found this world i was working at the hospital and when i had my children i was looking for a position where i could have a little bit more flexibility so i started doing private duty nursing okay and um, and came to the company who where I was working private duty, and they asked me if I would go over to the other side of the company and do visits in the home, intermittent visits. Okay. So I said yes, and then I worked there part-time until one of their employees was in an accident. Mm-hmm. They asked me if I would take their case for until they came back. They never came back. Okay. And so I went in to the field. I had a good base of medical nursing care, mm-hmm. And I loved going into the homes, taking care of the patients. It, it became a passion of mine mm. to make sure that I was able to take care of them and they didn't have to go back to the hospital. But yet when I left them and discharged them, they knew how to take care of themselves. Gotcha. So setting up the patients for success as well. Mm-hmm. It, it is intriguing to me. And I want to go ahead and point this out because I think it's going to be kind of an underlining component of your your of the conversation here. You've mentioned, I think, as we've been sitting here for the past few minutes, multiple times that you've been approached uh, for a position or approached for a change or approached to take this on. You've never said in just the short time that we've been talking about, I was trying to go get this or I was working for this. Mm -hmm. It sounds like you were being a good steward of the things that you were working on and people recognized that there Mm -hmm. was more there that you could take on more. Right. Why do you think that is? In a, in a world where people are constantly going, hey, you know, I, I need to be here. Put me here. Do this. Do this. What's the difference between doing basically the way that you've been operating, doing what you can and doing a really good job at it and being recognized versus always looking for that next opportunity? I've always lived um, um, professionally and in, in home a life that – is excellent. So whatever I do, I want to do it with excellence. Mm-hmm. I came into nursing to be a nurse. Never had a clue that I would be in management. But even as a nurse and working with the team, I wanted the team to be excellent. Mm. So as I found issues, I took it upon myself to help the team be successful, help myself be successful. And I didn't think of it as being a leader. Mm-hmm. It was just being a team player so that we could all be successful. What I've come to realize, no, you are leading, mm-hmm. um, leading by influence. And then as people begin to see that, they're like, we need you to manage this and that. And so I have gotten here without a game plan of being here. <laughs> people have just recognized the focus on excellence, the commitment to that, and the fact that you're willing to help others be successful. Mm-hmm. And that's I, those are massive factors in good leaders because – it's less about shining the light on that individual, more of how do I how do I help other people be great? Right. All right. So as you're as you're navigating this, so you were in in the realm of home nursing, and I think that that's a important factor. But I I think that some of the fundamentals that you're that that you have uncovered over the course of your career, probably the things that are applicable because maybe we're listening or maybe people that are listening or watching are going, well, I'm not in the nursing field. So how is this applicable to me? It's applicable because it's leaders, leading leaders, developing leaders, right? That's right. So you get into this perspective, you or your approach to take on more of a leadership role when you're like, hey, I really enjoy taking care of people. You, you said one of the satisfactions that you had was walking outside of somebody's home and knowing that you've helped them, right? Mm-hmm. 
how did you transition that passion for helping people into the leadership role when you're not actually directly helping people, you're indirectly helping people now? Right. So when I moved into leadership, what I realized is that I needed to help help the managers that I was managing um, or even the field staff that I was managing see how successful they could be. Okay. And I think as a, as a leader, you look and you see those lights that, that your staff have. What are they good at? And you help drive them into what they succeed. And if you can help them see their passion mm-hmm. and see their success, they'll do anything for you. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it's really not about identifying all their faults and failures, but it's really mo- motivating them to see their positives. Mm. And when you do that, then the light bulb comes on, they're motivated, they do the job, and you realize the job gets done a whole lot faster and efficient just because you've helped motivate them. So doing it through through influence rather than just handing out a list of tasks. Right. So it's there's a there's a book that um, that I, I re- reference quite frequently. It's it's one of uh, the books I think have, ha- has unpacked a lot for me, um, but it's by Michael Hyatt and it's the Vision Driven Leader. And he talks about the difference between a manager and a leader. Mm-hmm. A manager is one that manages and maintains and keeps things moving, and a leader is one that is inspiring and setting a vision and setting a path. And that's what I'm hearing you say is is exactly that. You, you classify yourself at, at points as a manager, but for somebody to be looking at what motivates people and unpacking that and getting them towards what their passion is, is significantly different than managing and making sure people are doing what they're supposed to be doing. Right. I can hire anybody off the street to manage data, mm-hmm. to manage metrics. Mm-hmm. I have to look for the qualities of a good leader. Mm -hmm. And if you can get a good leader, they can manage a team to success. Mm -hmm. And it's about finding the motivation. I think one of the things that I say to my leaders is point your vision down the road six months to a year. Mm -hmm. Let them know where you're going and then have them follow you to that end. Mm -hmm. If if your team doesn't know where you're going Mm -hmm. and don't know the success you're going to get to, Mm -hmm. they don't have the motivation to do today Mm -hmm. because they don't know that today's going to get them down six months to a year. And that's what a good manager does. That's what a good leader does. I was having a conversation with somebody literally last night before we were, before we were recording this and we were talking about just that very thing in in a sense of a business. uh, If there's no vision for the future, it starts to, you start to feel a lack of motivation, Mm -hmm. right? And so that's exactly what you're saying is constantly being able to cast that vision out, whatever that time frame of six months, 12 months, years down the line, uh, depending on the particular role, right? Mm -hmm. Where where that CEO may be casting it out for the next five years as you get to the the regional directors and to the direct managers, maybe it's a a 24 month to a 12 month, Right. right? So with that, you, you just mentioned something, and, and I'm, I'm intrigued by this because, especially in the sense that through your career, people have seen unique leadership qualities in you that maybe you didn't even see in yourself, right? Mm-hmm. You were just, I want to do the best at what I'm doing. And people have said, you know what, you actually are going to do a great job here and, and approaching you with these situations. How have you either been coached or how have you started to identify the next leaders that you're looking for now. You just said a few moments ago that you're looking for those those uh, those characteristics. What are those types of characteristics that you're looking for that you believe make a good leader? Uh, one of them, they have to be positive. Okay. Um, and then I I look for leaders that are organized mm-hmm. and mo- self motivated. Okay. Um, I can teach them how to do the business part. Mm -hmm. I can't teach them how to be motivated, to be positive, and to be a forward thinker. Mm -hmm. And so those are the things that I look for. If you have a negative person, Mm -hmm. it will ruin the entire leadership team. Mm -hmm. But if you have somebody that's positive and can see the issues that are going on, but can say, we will work through this and get to the other end, Mm -hmm. that's the kind of leader that you need. Um, I'm also, when I say self-motivated, if I see things that 
how do I do this? I don't know how to do it. I will read and study. Mm -hmm. I will go out there and find how to do it. Mm -hmm. And then, so I do love leadership books, leadership development, leadership podcast, uh, because I think we're always learning and there's always somebody out there that can teach us something. Mm -hmm. And I also push that on my managers. Mm -hmm. You know, don't depend on just me, but depend on, go out there and learn yourself so that I love getting gaining new nuggets. I love going to leadership conferences, leadership development, because I'm just a sponge. Mm -hmm. And I, then I like to push that out to my team. Mm -hmm. Sharing what you've learned and then motivating and inspiring them to do the same. Mm -hmm. So as as part of the practicality, like the, the business side of things, as, as a leader, as a director, you're having to share targets, share directives. Hey, this is where we're headed. How how have you found success? Maybe uh, it, you know, just thinking in terms of you know, we're we're sitting here having this conversation. Somebody that's listening or watching is going, man, I'm really struggling getting my team on board with whatever it is. Like we're trying to accomplish this, but I can't quite get everybody to get on board with it. How have you? Uh, what are some some successes that you've learned, or some ways that you've learned to get that? those metrics, those, that, those, that vision out there to get people to buy into it and to understand the value? So one of the things that I try to do is to begin to drop bread breadcrumbs. Mm -hmm. So as I know we're moving into this metric, and yep. this is a metric we need to hit, I will begin to drop the breadcrumbs and have them, the managers, look at how they can get there. Mm -hmm. And then... We set up the target, we set up the goal, and let's get there. Mm -hmm. um, recently, I had a manager that was just struggling. She couldn't get her team on board. She couldn't get her motivated. And so I would have brainstorming sessions with her mm -hmm. and say, tell me what you've tried. Now, what else could you try? Mm -hmm. How could you be different? How could you do this different? How could you divide it up into smaller pieces? Mm -hmm. What I found is just by asking her those questions, mm -hmm. she found the solution. Mm -hmm. So she divided into three parts, and now her team is motivated, and she's excelled the goal. Hmm. But it just took her brainstorming with me for her to figure out how she could get her team on board. Yeah. We understand the frustrations HOA board members and property managers face when deciding the best solution for their HOA and pool security. Should we use a keypad, hand out keys, or install a key card system? Do we even need cameras? These are some of the questions that are difficult to navigate and we're here to help. At LockDock Security, we've spent over 20 years working with homeowners associations and property managers to find a system that best fits the pool and HOA needs camera systems for the front gate or front entrance, key card systems for the pool gates, or simply updating the gate so that it meets safety and code compliance. We like to take the guesswork out of the process to answer any questions and help find the right solution. Our mission is to help you protect your people and your property, and that includes pools. Contact our team today to schedule your free consultation for your community. Okay, so earlier, before we started recording, you mentioned that one of your main tasks as a director is what? To remove their barriers. Remove their barriers. So which it's crazy, and it, we were laughing about it because I've, I've been on this uh, rant here for the past couple of months that uh, as part of our support team, their sole purpose in our organization is to remove blockers. Remove mm -hmm. blockers. What do we do to remove blockers? Mm -hmm. Uh, so that we can allow our, our, our installation team and our customer-facing uh, um, team members to be able to, to perform at high levels because we've removed their blockers. So when you talk about uh, removing those, those barriers, you just said that basically you sit down with a manager and you just started brainstorming, bouncing ideas off of. So it's a way to remove barriers and help them come to the answer on their own rather than just giving them the answer. That's right. What, how have you, is that something that you picked up through experience? Is that something that you were coached through? How, how did, how have you seen that come to play? Or is that just something you've always been naturally good at? <laughs> I think I have a natural bent okay. for that, but I had an amazing leader okay. that took me under her wing, probably was the most difficult leader I ever had All right. um, because she challenged me in ways I never thought I could do. But what she taught me was I could stretch myself to get there. And because she supported me in such a way, 
I was able to find those nuggets and I was able to do that. And I think I go back and ask myself, how would Sue do this? Yeah. What would Sue ask me? And I think she has been the most impactful in my life. Now, I also had a father who was a pastor Mm -hmm. and he was a leader. Mm -hmm. He taught me the basic leadership principles, not by... By, by me watching his actions, not by him setting me down. Sure. But I realize a lot of things that I do is because of, of how I watched him lead. Mm-hmm. And he was a very positive leader. So based off of, off of those experiences, and then you get to apply it back. So let me, let me ask a couple questions getting into the practical side of things because I, I, you, your organization went through uh, an acquisition over the past, what? Year. Year, Okay. What was that like? You being at a at, at a, a leadership position and being part of an acquisition. How did you manage through that? I I, I don't know all the details of it, but two companies come together. <laughs> so let me give you a picture. Okay. In January of 2020, mm-hmm. um, Medicare changed the way home health was reimbursed, how we were paid. Okay. And that was the first change in 20 years. Oh. Oh wow. Very big. Yeah. In March, we were acquired. Okay. And then we went into a pandemic. Uh, No big deal. It was a lot Mm -hmm. of change. What I realized, what what I needed to do the most is to get my arms around the teams and help them to feel safe. Okay. We will walk through this change together. Mm Mm-hmm. And we will navigate this together. So I had a lot of frequent meetings Mm -hmm. with them to say, let's walk through this. Tell me what your barriers are this week, where you've struggled. How do I need to help you get navigate into this company? And and we did that a lot Uh, when the pandemic hit and we had to provide personal protective equipment for all of our staff. Mm -hmm. We had to have very frequent meetings for me to even teach them how to get it, when to use it, how to use it how to dispose of it. Yeah. So with change, when change comes, there's an algorithm that I learned, and I wish I'd have brought it with me. All right. There are five different things that people need to have in order to be able to have change, and you've probably seen this before. Mm-hmm. And if you if you really watch that and, you, and they're resistant or they're questioning, um, you can kind of read where they are. Mm-hmm. So one of the things I've learned, and I've told my managers, if they are asking a lot of questions, it doesn't mean that they're not um, they're not buying into it. Mm-hmm. They're trying to figure out how to buy into it. Sure. Most managers get frustrated by all the questions. Mm-hmm. But if they realize, no, they are trying to figure this out, so they're really with you. Mm-hmm. It's the team that doesn't ask questions. <laughs> they're not on board. Yeah. And so I... I put my arms around them, and I said, we can do this together. Mm -hmm. And really, we had small wins, small wins, and you celebrate every win. And you help the team realize that they are making the changes. And then there are things that I went back and said, no, we can't do this. Mm -hmm. So I would go back to the corporate company and say, can we pause here? Let's get them through this next hurdle before we bring anything out. Mm -hmm. And And that has helped. Yeah. So you're protecting the team from new things that are coming down the line by saying, hey, we're not quite ready yet, mm-hmm. and also preparing the team to walk through what they're actually having to walk through. Mm-hmm. So you you saw a uh, a uh, upward tick in communication. You had to get more uh, engaged yes. in communication, not more distant and going, yeah, yeah, well, yeah, we'll, we'll all get there together. Right. You had to get really engaged in communication and let people know, hey, we're in this together and we're going to get through this and this is how we're going to get through it. Right, right. The 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 questions thing is very interesting from a um, uh, from a perspective. If people aren't asking questions, right, they're they're typically checked out. So uh, that's a good sign. It's embracing it because people want to know. We have been on a journey here over the past six months or so uh, on some uh, personality endeavors of understanding how people communicate, how people perceive receive information. And it's intriguing because whenever you're talking about those things, I, I kind of run it through those types of filters where mm-hmm. it's some people, that is that is innate in them. Mm-hmm. I need to ask questions so that I feel confident and comfortable in this process. Cutting them off from that is like cutting off their oxygen. That's right. right? <laughs> and so as a leader recognizing 
the difference between that and helping those people walk through it because change is, and, and especially for a lot of people like that, change is not comfortable. No. You know, some of us embrace change just because, hey, this is going to be fun and different. And some are like terrified right. uh, of that process. So going through that, you you had to manage uh, and help manage through an acquisition and through that process. Is that completed now? Is that are you, is that all kind of wrapped up or is there still processes that are still kind of lagging? I think we have gone the gamut of all the process change. We went through a medical record change. Mm -hmm. So we had to teach all the staff how to document differently in this new medical record. Okay. We also went through some leadership changes Mm -hmm. and then we went through their payment change. Oh, sweet. So they were paid salary Mm -hmm. and now they're paid per visit. Got it. And that took a lot of sure. discussion because you can mess with a lot of things, but don't you mess with their pay? <laughs> it's a, it's a, uh, for sure. That's 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 something that will that will uh, will will be questioned quickly. Okay, so uh, on and was that your first acquisition change that you had to deal with? No, actually, okay. this was second in my career. Okay, so what were some of the things that you learned through the first acquisition that you're like, oh my goodness, when we go through this one, I I gotta we gotta make sure that we're we fix some things because this is and this is a personal question because I'm interested in that. We acquired a, a couple of businesses over the last couple of years, and obviously that'll be something down the line as well. Merging two cultures together, merging processes together. What are some of the hurdles or the hiccups or the successes that you found with that? I think when you go through an acquisition, the the company that is merging with you, that mm-hmm. is coming into you, you have got to communicate a lot mm-hmm. and you've got to let them talk. They are grieving mm-hmm. the life that they're leaving mm. and you've got to help them grieve. You've got to help them celebrate what they lost. While most acquisitions are because companies are losing mm-hmm. money. I mean, that's usually when they put it on sale. Oh, but sometimes with ours, it was just that our our company and our board of directors was not set up to be long term sustainable mm-hmm. because of the way the healthcare is going. Sure, but um, you've got to help them embrace that. Mm-hmm. If you ignore that, they'll be so resistant to come into your team. Yeah, but if you can help them see that you really do care about what they've lost. Mm-hmm and bring them in and help them to be able to talk about it and then move forward, you'll have them on board a whole lot more. Mm -hmm. I have one manager that has been through both acquisitions and she is, I send her to the branch that needs the most love Mm -hmm. because when she walks in the door, everybody goes, we're okay because she's here. Mm -hmm. She's got that personality, but I think that's what a new acquisition needs. Mm -hmm. I'm here to help you. We're going to walk through this step by step. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I think you've got to give them your vision. Mm -hmm. They've got to quickly see this is where we're going. Oh, this is a good acquisition because we're going to get here Mm -hmm. where we couldn't before. And you've got to help them see all the added benefits of coming into that company. And if you can do that, then they will begin to embrace your rhythm and your, your vision. Just a quick diversion, because I want to get some context around this. The size of the organization that you work for now, what do you, the total size employees? Uh, so Bright Spring mm-hmm. is our corporate company. Okay. They're in 50 states. Okay. 350,000 patients. Okay. Um, our division, mm-hmm. which is home health. So Bright Spring does personal care, pharmacy, and home health. Okay. Our division is home health. In North Carolina, we have about 3,000 patients. Okay. Uh, we're in about eight or nine states, okay. which is about 7,000 patients. Okay. Um, we have probably 700 staff okay. in North Carolina. Um, so that's quite a few to, to run through. No, it, change. it is. And, and the, the reason that I was trying to get context of that is, is one, from the acquisition standpoint and the change, but two... It's incredible that a, an organization of that size, I mean, we're sitting here and, and everything that you're talking about is a personal touch. I'm recognizing that this individual has these character traits that are going to oh, that are going to work here. And I, I think a lot of times in business, especially when you're talking about scale, especially when you're talking large corporate environments, it's here's the role, here's the task, you go do what you do, right, mm-hmm. and, and be done. Um, and it's very... Uh, exciting to hear that there's still that personal level of understanding. And that's, you know, man, we talk about automation around here. You, we, we were talking about that before we got started. We love 
our automation. Mm-hmm. We love technology. But there is, it is not a replacement for the, the human not, touch, it's right? It's not. Making those decisions of going, hey, I recognize that this person has, has the emotional tact to be able to go into a place and make people feel comfortable. That's who needs to go there. Right. Versus uh, based off of the logistics and the approximate location here, this person is going to go. No, it's who's the best person for the job. That's right. Incredible. Can you copy this key? That's a question we get asked about 3,422 times a year. And how can you actually be sure that the person who asked that question is supposed to get a copy of that key? Well, we think you should always know who can copy your keys to your business and your home, because it could be your neighbor, an old employee, a contractor, or even worse, your mother-in-law. At LockDock Security, we believe in protected key systems, so you always know who has a copy of your key. To find out more, visit LockDoc.net or stop by our Charlotte location. LockDoc Security, helping you protect your people and your property. So with uh, all of the folks that that report directly to you at at a director's level, are these all folks that are in your office? You you rally around a table every day. what's What's the way that you're interacting with your team? So I try to go to their branch. Um twice a month. Okay. The rest of the time, it is phone calls and video conferencing. Okay. We do a lot of video conferencing. Um, COVID pushed us into that. We were doing some of it, but not near as much as we do sure. now. And um, and so we use a lot of camera mm-hmm. and, and talk face-to-face as a team, individual, one-on-one mm-hmm. to get that contact. So how, why do you do that versus just sending emails? It's much more personal. In order to communicate, mm-hmm. an email ha- takes the person out of it. You need to be able to see their eyes, their facial expression, and you need to be able to hear their voice mm-hmm. to really know if you're driving it home, mm-hmm. if they're getting it, or if they're totally confused. So when I we started the video conference, it was just, you know, turn your camera on, we'll talk. Mm-hmm. But now we've got deeper into turn your camera on, mm-hmm. Turn your audio on. Don't work emails. Pay attention. Mm -hmm. Ask questions that make them stop and think Mm -hmm. so that you have this two-way interaction instead of me just giving data Mm -hmm. or me just leading. Mm -hmm. Um, We had to learn that. That was tough. But the more that I can get them to interact with me, the more I know that they are on board and they've they've got the information. So a big tip to managing remote team members, remote employees, is to make sure that you have some level of engagement. Video obviously helps to increase that, but it's less of just turning the camera on. It's more of figuring out ways through the conversation to engage them through the communication rather than just dictating out information. Yeah. I've learned just recently Mm -hmm. that if you can break it up Mm -hmm. um, and make this meeting engaging, Mm -hmm they're so much happier and they will take it take it home with them. So recently I said to them, I, I try to have you know questions at the beginning. Let's just get everybody talking. Sure. One of the questions I recently asked is what is one thing nobody in this this team knows about you? Mm-hmm. So, you know, I was a salsa dancer. I was a, and so. You were a salsa dancer? No, they they would say that. (laughs) But as they say that, everybody becomes engaged with who is in that meeting. Mm -hmm. Oh, I never knew that about you. And so when you start the meeting, you've you've grabbed them. Yeah. You've grabbed their attention and you're ready to go forth. Yeah. I tried to learn salsa. I went to a dance class. Oh, did you? Yeah, it was not, it was very complicated. Yeah, I am not coordinated. Yeah. No, my son is. Yeah. You could get him to do some salsa. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, I did learn to tango. That was easy. Oh, sweet. Just It's a box. Every dance is a box. <laughs> Anyways, I don't know how we got on that subject. Me either. Um, okay. So managing remote employees uh, and then leading through um, – leading leaders. So th- I think that's, that's one of the big things I want to unpack as we kind of come to a close today is what are the tips that you would give, some advice that you would give in – leading leaders because at at a director's position you're now influencing managers that are influencing the frontline employees right is is that only how many tiers that there are or is there are there multiples so i'm the fourth line up fourth line okay so you have the field staff their manager Mm -hmm. 
and then you've got a second layer of managers to kind of just do the operations mm -hmm. than the director. Okay. And the director reports to me. So you you have a very long reach to influence the patient now, mm -hmm. where you came from an, an immediate direct application to the patient, making them realizing I've made an impact with them to now four steps removed from that. Mm -hmm. What are ways and tips that you would give people in saying this is just because you've moved into that, you can still have influence? Right. Um, one thing I do is I remind the managers that we saw enough of their leadership in them to want them to be in this role. Okay. So you've got to help them mm -hmm. embrace that role and be positive with them mm -hmm. and help them see what they are doing right mm -hmm. and then work with them on the areas they need to improve. I don't have, I don't bring on a new leader expecting them to be able to do everything. Mm -hmm. And so I do acknowledge the positive and then we go into, I use the sandwich method. Mm -hmm. You know, all the good things, this is what we need to work on and then now all the good things you're, you can do and sure. those kind of things. And so I think as a leader, you've got to make sure that you get this, this leader following you mm -hmm. and you've got to build enough trust. Mm -hmm. If they don't trust me, they're not going to follow me. Mm -hmm. And then I, I do drive it down to the patient. Why are we doing this? Why are we having this metric? Mm -hmm. It's about that patient. Mm -hmm. It's about making sure that patient stays out of the hospital. Mm -hmm. It's about making sure that patient mm -hmm. knows their medicine. And if I can drive every manager down to that point, then they're going to be motivated. Yeah. One of the things that, that was very helpful to me is when my mother became a patient. Mm -hmm. And I saw things from that point of view that I had never seen before. Yeah. And I was able to go back and say, hey, we need to rethink this. Sure. Because I thought this is how you need, but it's not. Mm -hmm. You needed to make sure the visit needed to change a little bit. The reporting back to the manager needed to be changed a little bit. The mm -hmm. communication needed to be improved. And so I think that if you can drive those live, real live events back home to, the, to your team, yeah. It's the greatest leadership thing you can do. Yeah, it's it's that that point in and of itself is very intriguing to me when you're in a leadership position and you have influence and then you also become a consumer either of the same product or uh, of a similar product, similar. right? Mm -hmm. And so we, we talk about that a lot here when, you know, uh, one of us in the organization experiences, uh, has, has an experience with a service provider positive or negative, and you bring it back and say, okay, here's what I experienced. This was something that we need to work on and make sure we're not doing this to our customers because right. we now have uh, experiential data to say, <laughs> this is not the way that I want to feel, or this is the way that I want to feel. Right. And so now we can work uh, work our systems to, to, to be mindful of that. So you know, it's, a, it's one of those things that's it's an unfortunate, but it also gives you a whole nother level of understanding once you become that disconnected from the ultimate Absolutely. End, right? Absolutely. Very cool. Well, I appreciate you coming in today. It's been uh, a wealth of knowledge. I think it's very practical in a sense, identifying uh, leadership qualities, making, you know, in, in identifying those qualities in people that you can coach up mm -hmm. and then also making sure you are communicating through change because that's what people need so that yes. they feel comfortable with it. From a leader's perspective, when change happens, you've already processed it. You already have moved through the change. And now everybody else is kind of coming in going, what in the world's going on? Right. So taking that step back and being mindful of it is, is, a, is good advice. Well, Lynn, thank you again for joining us today. It was such a blast. Got a lot of takeaways, and I think this is a valuable conversation that people can share and pass around. If this is your first time listening, we appreciate you joining us today. Make sure you subscribe because we have a brand new episode every Tuesday morning at 9 a.m. You can find out more by visiting lockdoc.net slash podcast. Have a great week, and we'll see you next time.